Welcome to the Tapestry of Life. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services at Community College of Philadelphia. Today's topic is resilience and health. Coping with stress and adversity and returning to normal states of daily functioning by avoiding negative consequences of one's behavior is usually what is meant by resilience. Ten factors that promote resilience appear to be one, the ability to cope with stressful challenges effectively. Two, having good problem solving skills. Three, the ability to seek help from others. Four, believing that there is something one can do to manage one's feelings and cope with life. Five, having a social support network. Six, being able to self-disclose trauma to loved ones. Seven, having a sense of one's spirituality. Eight, having an identity as a survivor as opposed to a victim. Nine, helping others. And finally, 10, finding positive meaning in one's trauma. I want to welcome my co-host today, Dr. Connie Watson, a colleague of mine in the Department of Psychology at Community College of Philadelphia and my two special guests, Taylor Ray and Delano Turnseed Jr. I hope I got that one we'll kind of close. Again. Delano Turnipseed. Oh, Delano Turnipseed Jr. Yes, sir. Well, this is an interesting topic. I'll tell you why to me it's an interesting topic to get started, because kind of uh, uh, resilience is almost like uh, the cornerstone of health to me. I mean, it's a topic that hasn't been around a whole lot to be discussed. In the last 10 or 15 years, maybe, it's become quite a popular topic. And, uh, and you know, all of us who are familiar with, you know, learning, uh, learned, uh, what is it called? Hopeless, Help, helplessness, helplessness or learned uh, optimism, which mm -hmm. is the other one, know that there's this whole thrust of positive psychology. And as a person who has been in the field treating individuals, uh, if you're resilient, you make it. It's basically a, a simple, I don't know, Connie, if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I think the positive psychology movement has been very interesting, uh, of course, and then we're right here in Philadelphia with the University of Pennsylvania taking such a lead on that. Martin Seligman and then Angela Duckworth with her work on grit, which is very similar. Sure. Um, and so I think that there's a lot we can learn from it in terms of characteristics, um, stories that we can learn from others, uh, which include problem solving, sure. um, but also I think just the, your perspective. Um, so we have so much power within ourselves to choose our perspective, like you were saying, either feel like a survivor or a victim, or feel like we can make an optimistic future for ourselves, or even how we think about the past. Um, well, that was uh, in that situation. This situation's different, so I feel more positive, I feel more in control. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah even wonderful. the way in, in times, the, the way as we get more mature in our concept of resilience, even the way we look back at what the event was, mm -hmm. you know, it, mm -hmm. it, actually the event even changes as we heal mm -hmm. because it's not a static thing back there. It's, it's constantly in process. So what was negative can be seen very much like a positive. In recovery, we're constantly talking about that topic, you know, like people talk about. Uh, if it wasn't for my addiction, I wouldn't be in the good place that I'm in today. They don't necessarily see it as a negative, but early in the event, they see it as, as quite a negative experience. What's grit, by the way, for people who might not? Well, I think when you look at the idea of resilience, um, grit takes a more long-term perspective. Okay. So resilient, you might be resilient in the moment, right? You know, and you could certainly be a resilient, have resilient characteristics as a person. Uh, but grit is for the long haul. It's the idea, it's like resiliency on, in a marathon, oh, okay. right? So you have grit year after year, um, you have this explanatory style and this optimism and this way of looking at the world that you're, you're gritty, you're gonna hang in there, okay. you're gonna do what it takes um, through the ups and downs, okay. right? And what's interesting with uh, Duckworth's research is she's been looking at grit with IQ and personality characteristics and environmental uh, issues. Okay. Um, and it looks like it's one of the best ways to predict, predict even. Predict future. Yeah, future uh, success. So um, I think this can be really powerful. Sure. Does any of this make any sense? 
I remember it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that makes sense. Yeah. What kind of sense does it make for either one of you? Or? I think resiliency for me is basically a thick layer of skin. Um, you know, throughout the trials and tribulations throughout your life, you could take those lemons that you received in life and turn that into lemonade. Mm -hmm. That's what I use when I describe my resiliency. Um, I basically, I grew up in North Philadelphia. Um, my mother was the only person in my family I graduated from a real university. She graduated from Temple University and she moved me to the suburbs when I was young. So, um, you know, that kind of helped me see, you know, a new world basically. And when I would go back and visit my friends in North Philadelphia, I kind of tried to be cool and like, you know, dumb myself down to, you know, seem cool and fit in with everybody. But um, you know, I was throwing curveballs like my father left out of my life when I was very young. Um, you know, my parents separated. So it was kind of tough for me, like mentally to, you know, cope with that, you know, that issue. And um, I basically was just a strong individual. Um, I had family support. I had people, you know, in my corner, you know, telling me everything is going to be all right. You know, you're a positive young man. You need to, you know, stick to your positive roots. And um that just carried me throughout my life. Um, recent graduate from the Community College of Philadelphia. Um, I recently had a class with uh, Professor Connie and it was awesome. Um, we learned all about grit and resiliency and um, grit and resiliency is actually my um, Facebook, you know, highlight. Oh, okay. So when you look up me, it'll say, you know, grit and resiliency is my makeup, okay. so. You know, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, I, we had before the show talked that we both grew up in kind of North Philadelphia, actually only a block or two away from each other. Yep. And, and not <laughs> two different generation, I am. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I, I've often wondered when you, uh, uh, people would say, you know, you, you kind of grow up in, in, at least in my case, I grew up in the sense of, uh, you know, a poverty stricken area. Uh, uh, my mother was not educated at all. I think she had a third grade education. Mm -hmm. She's bilingual. She spoke Italian, and, and and she didn't really understand what the hell was going on mm -hmm. in, in the culture. And my father had, a, you know, we talked about Gillespie and Gratz in the sense of their, their experience. And I often wondered how 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 I was able to get out of that. I mean, in, in, in a sense, how you said, and, and it's interesting, you said your parents moved mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. to start the transition. Exactly. Which is exactly what happened to me, too. Interestingly enough, they moved up into, like, Roxborough section of, of, of the city. Okay. And I used to go back all the time because mm -hmm. I still had a lot of my old friends were still back there. Yep. And I don't know if, I know what you mean when you say dumbing down. You don't mean that they were dumb and you were smart. I know you don't mean it that way. Yeah, you mean I was that just, there's a, a way of dealing with the world. And I knew better. Yeah, I knew yeah, better, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. would try to act like I didn't know any better. I was ignorant to the fact, but I actually knew better, but I would try to fit in and seem cool, so. Yeah. But um, When you reference uh, resilience, was there, I mean, because it reflects some of my experience when I, when I ask you this question. Was it like something you were like, was it readings that moved you forward? Uh, was it the fact that you found uh, two new friends that, you know, like what, what supported or was a catalyst to your resilience as you were growing up, would you say? I, I went mean, to the same kind of question. Right? I graduated from, um, I went to Catholic school when I was young. So I went to Jesu school, which is on 18th and Thompson. Uh, it's kind of affiliated with St. Joseph's Prep. And um, I was really close with the staff there, the teachers and the priests. And Father Burr, he's actually the president of um, St. Joseph Prep now, but he used to be the president of Jesu School when I was there. Oh, okay. So he really like used to sit us down um, and he told us like, I was in a program called Young Scholars. And um, basically I was, you know, mentored by him and um, mentored by other staffs, males. And they basically told us to be like, you know, positive. Um, we need to do good out in the world. We need to help the homeless. We need to um, basically derive these positive attributes that we have deep inside of us that we don't know that we have. Um, so yeah, I have I have always been like around positive people that inspired me to sure, be there, positive. There's a kind of a, a, and there's a lot of that going on in a lot of the communities right now of setting up mentoring programs. Mm -hmm. We have one here at the college, you know, the Center for Male Engagement. You know, there are mentoring programs that uh, we believe really are particularly helpful in building resilience. And I, mm -hmm. you're an example of that. And I, I could remember, you know, it's interesting, you know, you, you, you grow up almost in a, in a, I grew up as a Christian, Roman Catholic. And, mm -hmm. and I do remember the, the priest, how helpful they were. I also remember how negative they can be at times, but mm -hmm. I do remember how supportive they were 
in, in moving you forward and, and, and telling us uh, very positive things that, you know, about our culture in mm -hmm. particular, you know, and, and it's important also that, that you do vest, resilience is vested in a, a positive image of your cultural heritage, mm -hmm. don't you think? I mean, you, you kind of look back and you say, these people were helpful to me. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember that happening to me. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, is, is going to be a mentor for an awful lot of people that maybe never met him, mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, because they're going to say, wow, here's a person of color who's president of the United States. Mm -hmm. No matter how much they want to tear him down and all the kinds of things that are going on right now, the fact that the image is there is going to do a lot for people in the sense of mm -hmm. the mentoring process. Wouldn't you think that this... Yeah, if you can see yourself, you know, if someone like me succeeded or got through this, right, whether it's someone you personally know who can share stories with you, um, which I think was, was really powerful, mm -hmm. or if it's some kind of image or something that you can kind of latch on to are both important. But I think also you said males, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. um, if both genders are involved in mentoring and leading you, and I think it's important to have uh, young men um, have male role models. In, in education systems, there's a lot of women, right? And sure. so to have other males, especially for the young men, um, for the girls too, of course, but uh, I think it's really powerful. Yeah. Does this make any sense to you? Yeah, I'm uh, thinking back. I went to Catholic school as well. Um, my parents came from North Philly, and before I was born, we moved up to Mount Airy. So I really, everything I did or looked back was a blur, but I was always grateful that they at least gave me the jump start, um, or I guess the backbone. My father was always there for us. Uh, my mother, of course, um, neither one of them uh, graduated college, but they did attend. So I always looked, uh, when I originally left high school, I went to, to play uh, football on a football scholarship, and I failed out my first year. Never went back, went to work, and never looked back at trying to go back to school again. But I, I guess my resiliency at that point was just to try to make it through life yeah. um, prior to my accident. And then I think my jump started the last few years after going through uh, depression, which I didn't know if it was depression or I called it laziness, and there still may be a little bit of that, was just seeing my children grow up and they just see their dad sitting in the room. Mm -hmm. And that kind of bothered me for a little bit. So came to school. Finally, after uh, seven years of being in the chair, and met great people, professors, uh, Connie here as well, and I think that's what's helped me out to uh, now I mentor other people in chairs, or I go to different programs, or I speak at uh, uh, Jeff Thomas Jefferson University mm -hmm. to some of the pre-med students, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and just how life is in general. So. I think I'm at the point where you were talking earlier about giving back, mm -hmm. and actually it's, it's helped me out. Uh, yesterday I spoke to an eighth grade class that came over from Jersey, and we just spoke about what life is to try to have them prevent injuries, and they were receptive to it, and I think that's part of my resiliency, or grit at this point is, I don't need help. I look at myself being handy capable, but um, I'm just willing to help more than I was before. I'm out of the shell, I guess you would say. Sure. So it's, Do you mind sharing with us what happened? How did you... Oh, um, my birthday, a rebirth, happened August 16th, 04, motorcycle accident, oh, okay. three minutes from my house, um, got hit by a van, um, uh, was known I coded twice on my way down. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, I was upset that after they brought me back, um, I was incubated, uh, they self-induced and uh, put me in a coma in order to let my body heal. And the only thing I think at that point that saved me was a month after being in the hospital, uh, mentally at least jump-started me, is when two of my children came at that point. They were uh, six and four at that point. And my four-year-old was singing to me. Uh -huh. And that was the first time I cried in years. And I knew that was part of my process of healing. That's why I was still here. But it still took me years afterwards in order to try to be more productive or uh, I guess you would say a, a role model for them yeah. or for myself first sure. and then hopefully for them. Well, it, 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 it sounds, and, and normally when I say sounds, it, like normal sound it is, that you would be in some kind of a depression. Mm. I mean, who wouldn't? Right. I mean, it would be almost abnormal if you weren't depressed. 
But see, the resilience probably comes in is the how you manage the depression and then mm -hmm. moved yourself forward. Yeah. You know? I would think so. Um, I still fight through it every day. Sure. You know, yeah. but, but that's not just because of jazz. I, I look back and try to remember before this happened. And again, I, I won't call it depression, but maybe it was laziness or I'm going to mask it and say it was depression where it took me a while just to kick the rust off or dust off. Sure. Like I couldn't imagine 10 years ago, five years ago, coming to school and now achieving, I guess you say some moderate success. Um, where before I couldn't remember anything that that in school. Twelve years of Catholic school, uh, college. Tried to go back to college a few times afterwards, but this time, um, you just had a program. We just had a program here, complete, mm -hmm. um, complete, basically complete what you start. And that's my goal right now is to complete what I start. My oldest child, she'll graduate with uh, from Westchester this year, and my son is a sophomore here, as a matter of fact. So for me, it's really a not a competition, but it sort of is because sure. they inspired me to come back to school without even knowing about it. So I'm um, just trying to lay tracks. Sure. You know, you. I, I, I want to digress to something you said a little earlier, which I find interesting because of some other shows that we've done. And this, I teach a course on faith and spirituality and, and singing and, and the fact that someone sang to you. Uh -huh. um, you know, one of the threads to your soul where people sometimes believe like it's music, dance, and you know things like that, and singing is one of them. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you said that that had an influence on you, yeah. that 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 helped pull you forward. Absolutely. I, I wish I could remember the name of the song she sang, but she she did her best, and it and it, it inspired sure. me at that point. I needed something to pit perk me up. I was in the hospital for almost three months, so it took a while even with that going home and not having accessibility. Um, living in my dining room for a while, having to be bumped up and down steps. It was like I lost freedom, finances. Even just going to the bathroom, friends, right? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, all kinds of stuff. anything at that point, so I had to relearn life. Yeah. Um, but that was in the past, and now I'm just trying to, uh, I'm in a mentoring program through McGee as well, go there and speak to other people, whether it's working out or um, just trying to, like I said, just push through every day. And coming to the CCP, or just getting out the house was a big help sure. for me. So right now it's a challenge for myself, just keep going through it. And I, I'm impressed with what he was saying over here as well. I was like, <laughs> how can I follow up off of that? But um, we meet good people and it's about building relationships and bonds at this point. It truly so is, yeah. That's yeah. What, what a lot of people don't really understand is that, you know, we, we often, and if you read any, and I'm sure you've read, but if you've ever read any of Fritz Perls's work in dealing with uh, Gestalt psychology, and, and, and he, one of the books I remember called In and Out of the Garbage Can, in which he said, stay away from toxic people, mm -hmm. because toxic people don't help you. Mm -hmm. And in the sense of resilience, you need to stay with positive people, because they're the ones that will kind of move you forward. Okay. Because Poison make will poison you. Absolutely, it sounds like a simple, a simplistic way of looking at the I world. Always, I always say uh, energy suckers. I don't know if I said that in your, cl mm -hmm. or your class or not, but um, you know, are are you with people who are sucking energy out of you, or are you with people that you're building each other up? Right, right, and really, you can be mindful about setting boundaries with people and deciding who to spend time with. Right. right, and so to be, and, and we all do that. My kids were just talking about this the other day. One of my daughter's little friends said to her, I like you because you don't gossip. <laughs> I, I like being around you because I can be myself, right. right? And so I just thought that was wonderful. I was really proud of my daughter that this other child had said that, but I was thinking from being 12 to, you know, being a middle-aged person, there's people that we can choose to be with, right, that we build each other up and we help each other, or we can tear each other down. Think about our relationships. Yeah. Well, I, I think if, if you would have stayed around people that kept tearing you down, you'd never gotten here. No. You, you have to find mm -hmm. uh, and seek out possibly. And sometimes I've often said to people, even though they're your blood relatives, they're not necessarily the people you need to hang out with, because some of them are worse than people you don't know yeah. sometimes, you know, because they, they don't facilitate your movement forward. Yeah, my mother has been, um, I'm almost 50 myself, so I won't put her age out there, <laughs> but uh, she even came to uh, my induction to Phi Theta Kappa oh, the other right. day. I didn't want her to come. 
you know, because I wasn't sure how it would be or if it was a waste of time or anything. I was grateful she was there. Spoke to a dean at the same time, and he was happy that she showed as well. Just as old as you may be, you still need that that push to get you through the hump. So um, she's always been there. My father, unfortunately, he um, passed away a few years ago, but he was a big push. When I look back, he was always my friend. He was my father. He disciplined to do anything else, but he always kept us in line, myself and my sister. So um, I think I had a good basis. I just took it for granted and uh, it took a while to get back through that. Does it make sense to you too? Yeah, Some it makes sense. sense. What, if you had to like a talk to the audience and say to them, well, these five things were tremendously important in building uh, a positive attitude toward my life or resilience. What, what, based on your experiences, what would you think of? I mean, I, I mean I, I'll answer the same question because, you know, resilience is resilience is resilience and it's just not among one or two different people. I mean, to me, education was, was a very, very key element to building resilience. The fact that, that I could see a space that I never thought I would be able to operate in and the fact that I can get rewarded for being in that space by studying, you know, which was kind of like revolutionary to me. And it's going to sound weird, but the other thing was having a bicycle. I was able to leave my neighborhood. It sounds like a weird, it's almost I felt resilient. I got on my bike and I would go to like 28th Street, you know, or go to send downtown. And I was able, and, and the mere fact that I was able to travel or, around also was a resilient quality. I knew there was something else out there besides just my little group of people that, that I interacted with. So to me it was education and the ability to be mobile, to have a mobile kind of attitude about mm -hmm. the world. And to realize that there were other people in the world. Well, I grew up, I, didn't, I, I just thought that there were just my people you know, because of the area that I, I grew up in. And it took me a while to realize that I, I live in a totally different culture than I was in. But what's, what helped me survive a lot of the stories that we hear is really my whole uh, uh, being able to, when, when people got negative on me, you know, and, and had stereotypes and stigmas about Italians, in my case, I remember uh, thinking of all the great people in my culture you know, like, and, and how resilient that made me to know that there are positive role models and good things happen, you know, and I don't know if those, and, and then when I, and, and one of the reasons why I stay teaching at community college, because I could have gone to a lot of places and teach, I mean, in, in all sincerity. The reason I stay here is because when I turn that corner to my office, I see people just like me, with their different culture maybe, mm -hmm. different issues going on, but the same kind of issues of life, mm -hmm. trying to kind of do things. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, it makes absolute sense. Yeah, it does. You have a hunger. Yeah, it's, it's like, a, yeah, it is that way. It's a kind of an interesting, um, and I don't, I don't know, what, did, did you, how, how did you grow up, Connie? I don't, I don't know if, uh, how your resilience evolved. Or. Uh, well, I, I grew up in um, a Midwestern town and my mother um, didn't finish school. She had me, and then she ended up years later getting her GED. Um, but she was very much a self-starter. So I learned a lot about resiliency in just terms of, if you wanna figure something out, you can do that. You can read, you can find mentors, you can learn how to do things. So she taught herself the art of massage and yoga, and then she was an entrepreneur in that area for a lot of years, taught herself gardening and cooking. Um, and my dad was a therapist who worked with drug and alcohol issues in, in juveniles. Um, so that was interesting growing up like that. I uh, didn't get away with much. Um, but what he really taught me was this idea of psychology and being the person you want to be. And we'd have lots of conversations about that. Um, I think what was maybe unique for me in terms of connecting with other people and helping build each other up was that I felt a little bit of an outsider where we lived in terms of um, we were probably lower middle class in an affluent community. Um, we were Jewish in a Christian community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my mom and I are Canadian, even though that's not that much difference. Uh, it, it was enough that I had this different perspective. 
Um, and so a lot of my friends and people I hung out with were people who felt a little marginalized too. And I remember having a lot of social support and conversations um, with friends of different ethnicities, of different religions, um, who maybe didn't fit in. And we kind of helped build each other up. And so I did that from a young age. And I think ever since then, I've done that. I've found people to connect with and, and feel supported with. I had some learning disabilities um, growing up, too. I remember I was just seven or eight when my brother was born. And I remember looking into his crib and saying, you're going to get to go to college. I probably oh. won't get there, but you'll get there. Oh, really? Yeah. And like just having a big thing about, I'm going to help my brother. Like, if I can't get to college, um, he'll get to college. So I got to college. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember counselors saying, well, you know, you could be a hairdresser <laughs> or you could oh, really? be an airline stewardess. Right. And I was like, no, you know, I, I'm going to figure this out. Mm. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, years later, after I had my master's in psychology and was teaching for a while, I get accepted to an Ivy League school, right? And so I just feel like it's kind of like never giving up. You keep having these roadblocks, but in your mind, you keep saying, I don't care how long this is going to take me. I'm going to get somewhere. I'm going to get to that finish line, right? Because it's important to me. Yeah. Yeah, there is a lot to that. It's almost like when you watch the water in the stream, the way it runs. If, if it hits a block, it works its way around yep. in order yeah. to get to the lake or wherever it's mm -hmm. going. And, and, and the ones that have trouble are the ones that get stopped and they don't seem to f navigate their way uh, into an, another place. And I think all resilient people find a way to navigate mm. and don't listen so much to negative expectations, right. which is the story you mentioned, yeah. the sense of negative expectations. But I think we all go through that negative expectation. I, I remember too being, you know, like you're not, you know, you're not going to make anything. You know, like they wanted me to be a bricklayer. Mm. I do lay brick, but it's a different kind of brick I lay now. You know, it's like life's bricks and stuff. But and the, and those are fine professions. Yeah, they are. I'm not arguing it at all. Right. And and the same thing. You know, if I had been interested in that, mm -hmm. right. Sure. But I was saying one thing, and they were saying, oh no, here's another idea. Right. You know. So I think that's. So see, here's, here's the issue, and I don't know if this applies to both, both of you too, but we, we grow up and people tell us things about what we are, and sometimes we accept them and we don't do anything but agree and become a person that we maybe didn't want to become. And then sometimes we listen to them and we say, no, I'm better than that, and I wonder what mechanism is doing that? I mean, we talk about generally the concept of, you know, resilience. And, but I also think it has something to do with some of the material you and I have talked about flow. Mm -hmm. You know, the way, the way your life flows. If, if you get in sync with your flow, you, you, you actually will be able to move in spaces that you kind of wouldn't have moved in before. You have a better sense of your space, of where you're going in life. I don't know if that makes that make sense? I look back, I, I cannot remember anyone saying, um, you're going to do this or do that. I think I had, I had freedom. Oh, okay. Um, so I can't say anybody was ever negative to me. I remember the positives. I remember getting my hand smacked in first grade by the principal at my Catholic school. But besides that, no that negativity. It's like a modus operandi in Catholic school. It, well, yeah, yeah, the golden <laughs> rule. I, I don't even know what I supposedly did that day, but yeah, exactly. I remember it. Um, but I was never boxed. Oh, okay. And I knew when I went to high school, the only way for me to go to college at that point was to play ball. So I did that. And like I said, I failed. It wasn't anybody else. My parents weren't, they were disappointed, I guess you recall, because I wasted quite a bit of money um, not their money, but I look at it like, yes, I did, because they spent all that to put me through in order to get me to be successful. And I look back even now like uh, I wasted their time, I wasted their money. But just speaking to my mom this morning, she said it wasn't your time at that point yeah. to finish off school. But now is I'm more focused, I guess you would call it. Um, so. And sometimes you need those negative experiences in order to go forward. Yes. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, people would say, you know, like, uh, why do you keep talking about recovery, your recovery, and so, well, because it, it, it's a significant part of one's life, mm -hmm. and you need to turn those negatives into positives in order to stay resilient. Correct. And I, I think that's, 
you know, you could have easily just forgot, just said, the hell with it all. I'm not going to deal with it. I mean, I want it to be a football. I want it to be this. I want it to be that. And, uh, you know, you're not going to appreciate you being depressed for a while. But the resilience is that you, you did get out of it. Yeah. You I did move say. forward. It's a process. Um, I said my process at this point was for a while not accepting the fact that I was in a chair, knowing the reality that I was. I never said I uh, was depressed because I couldn't walk. I was depressed because I was limited oh, the way okay. I look at it. So um, when you talk about resiliency, mine was to try to find different ways like today, trying to plot my path here. Do I go up a hill, down a hill? So you're always trying to pre-think of what I'm going to do or what I plan on doing. So the same thing in school, picking my classes. Is this class going to fit my schedule? Everything is just, like you said, the building blocks at this point. Um, and I'm being more comfortable, I guess you would say. So my resiliency, we spoke earlier about um, what was my process. My process was, was, like I said, my mother for one. Then I have a friend where I just thought about, she's a professor and she's been telling me for years, you need to go back to school, you need to go back to school. And I would, I, I signed up for CCP three times prior. And then one day I said, you know what, I can't do it again. Let me go down. I took the placement test, didn't do well in it, had to take remedial math and English. But then from there, biology and anatomy and physiology and speech and just classes, I didn't really think I would fit in well. And like you said, um, I'm being rewarded the way I look at it through scholarships and just my grades in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I was speaking to a young lady the other day and I mentioned it pays to go to school when we're talking about scholarships. She said, no, it pays well. To, it pays to do well in school. So that, to me, that's my finish line. Every time I do something, I want to do something else. So I, I'd like to, I'm competitive in my own spirit at this point. When we talk about spirituality, that's my spirituality right now. Just keep going and finding a way around until I, until I hit the finish line, which I don't have a finish line. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's always evolving. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's always flowing. You know, it's always moving. Flowing. When you stop moving, I guess you you leave this earth or something. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, something like that must happen. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm 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 72 now. You know, and I'm still like moving. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm trying to learn how to play a guitar now. I mean, who the hell you know? You know <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I figure well, I, I like to do something different. And I think resilience has a lot to do with you. You keep moving. Because if, if you notice, sometimes people retire and they die. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they, they lose whatever breath they had in, in their life. So I think it is a, a, a process of continuous, continuous, continually using your life in a positive way. Absolutely. You know, and I, I, like, I can't wait till I get to a certain, well, no, I, I, why? you know, they're, they're 40 years ahead of themselves waiting to try and get there when they should really live here in the now. We, always, we often talk in psych about living today and, and having short-term goals and long-term goals, but making sure that you do things with your life. Absolutely. See, that point where you were stagnant, say, and you felt, whether you use the word depression or whatever, it, that kind of thing goes like this in the sense of flow, and, and it does get you in trouble. Yeah, I, I did some things. I sh shouldn't have done. I look back, I don't think I was excessive, but for me, the accessibility, any place that I went to, wanted to, to be social, I was at a bar. Yeah. To watch the game, to hang out with other people because I didn't have to worry about getting bumped in somebody's house or anything else. So I would sit at the bar you know, three, four times a week. Never thought there was anything wrong with it. Um, so that was my process. I think, and then drinking was part of the, because it's already a depressant, so I'm doing mm -hmm. that. I'm taking pain medicine, and it's like there was a double jeopardy, so I stopped the pain meds. I can't say I stopped drinking. I have one sure. you know, on a Sunday here and there watching the game, but nowhere near, and my mind is a lot clearer than it has been the past couple decades. So I think I'm in recovery of one way or another. Sure. Yeah, we, we have to uh, uh, continually cleanse our body and our mind in order to find our spirit. And You know what, you know, you know what I kind of find interesting about resilience is this whole concept of the relationship between resilience to flow or motion in life. And, and a lot of people think of uh, flow as a linear concept. And, you know, we think about it in recovery and we say, oh, you got 20 months in, you got 30 months in. But to be honest with you, a, a relapse at 25 months is not the same as a relapse at one month. Mm 
Mm. There's, there's a difference. There's time. Mm. But I think the concept is incorrect. I think the concept really is more a, a concept of circularity in life, that much of what happens in our life always comes back to revisit us. It's kind of the way, it's the flow of life, so to speak. For example, the, the world's trying to tell us something. When we want to go to Mars or to the moon, we don't go on a straight line. We go on almost a circle to get. And when we get into trouble, we loop behind Mars and come back. We don't go there, then turn around and come back. And, and we have four seasons, you know? Fall, summer, spring, winter, you know? And the reality of life is, is the universe is trying to tell us something about how we deal with the world. And until we accommodate ourselves to the flow of life, we'll always have stress and anxiety and depression. So one of the things I think we need, really need to work on is getting into the flow. So if you have a problem, it'll always come back to revisit you. And if you know it's always going to come back, then you won't feel so bad about it always coming back. And hopefully when it comes back the third time, you will have two good experiences with it mm -hmm. in how to manage the flow. You know, we, 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 you know, so relapse is a normal part of life, whether it's alcohol or it's trauma. It, it's just how we deal. Is it a capital T or a small T when it flows back? You know, you know we, it's, it's a fairly com. Um, you know, I used to, when I was younger, I did some sailing when I was in graduate school. I went sailing. And, and, you know, when you see a storm in front of you, and it's the first time you've been on a sailboat, you look at the storm and you don't know what the hell is going on. And the storm just overwhelms you, you mm -hmm. know. But when the storm comes back the second time, you know, you should have learned something from that storm. And, okay, lower the sails, you know, point into the wind, you know. But if you keep getting knocked down, and never learning from the circularity of the experience, well, I guess you'll always be depressed. It's, it's you a know. mindfulness. Yeah, it's right? a kind of a mindfulness. And reflective practice, right? So you're not just running around letting life happen to you, but you're trying to learn from it and, and think about it and think about how I'm going to operate next time. Yes. Right? You know, yeah, it so seems there's like some a, of that mindfulness. It, yeah, it does that. seem like a, like a simple thought. But it gets complicated because what that means is that you're responsible for your mood. Mm. And therefore, you, have, you can take charge of your mood. Now, I understand that there's brain functioning, and I understand that sometimes neurotransmitters are down, mm. and we need to give you a little dopamine or a little serotonin, and then they call them antidepressants. I mean, I understand that people need AIDS uh, to help them heal, and sometimes your biology just isn't functioning right. And maybe it never functioned right. You could have been mm -hmm. born with th that deficit. I'm not taught, I mean, I think that's a small percentage of the issues that we talk right. about in counseling. Mm -hmm. I think it's a small percentage. It's there, and I, I surely would never on this show or any show or in class ever say to a student, stop taking your medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that helps. But what I'm saying is we shouldn't rely so much. Mm -hmm. It's not the first resort. It should be the last resort. So... You know, it's a little bit like, uh, and then I'll ask you to kind of comment on it. It's a little bit like Christianity. You know, we, we talk about the three of us here are, are Christians. You know, if, if, if Christ died on the cross and never was resurrected, there would be no flow to the faithful. There would be no faithful. It's in his rebirth that we have Christianity. And that's the way life is. It's in your ability to be resilient. And every time you're resilient and you rebo you're reborn in a sense, and I mean that in a very loose sense when I say reborn, that is really a, a resolution back to the flow to the faithful, whatever faithful that might be in Judaism, well, Christianity. That's a, that's a metaphor. I think yeah. it might be across spiritual traditions right? yeah. from indigenous, right? right. Um, you know, we can see some similarities in that idea. Yeah. Of rebirth and, and that's renewal. What people, yes, renewal and rebirth. And that's mm -hmm. what people don't seem to... I don't know whether they don't hang on to it enough. I mean, I, I don't really know. I, mean, I don't know. And I mentioned during our, our brief break mm -hmm. that sometimes, uh, you know, some of the things that I read in Buddhism is, you know, like, 
It, 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 sometimes when uh, the gardens over here, there's two different gardens. There's the negative garden and the positive garden, so to speak. And we should really spend more time in the positive garden and not spend as much time in the negative garden. And, and sometimes if we play in the negative garden too much, we lose our positive experiences. And I said, yeah, when I get that way, I don't play in the negative garden. I go and sit in, even though I'm not a, a very much of a crack, the practicing Christian now, I go and sit in the cathedral and I kind of embrace that part of the garden, so to speak. And, and that allows me to be even continually more resilient. I don't know if this makes sense any sense to make sense to me and I think for me um, resiliency I'm gonna use something from we're reading a book called flourish by Martin Seligman and um, basically practicing daily your positive qualities not focusing on your negative qualities like people telling you oh you're not good at this you're not good at that but focus on what you're good at and you could better prepare yourself for you know the setbacks you may have in life um, I get a lot of my resiliency from nature. I like to meditate. Okay. I like to fish. I like to go hiking. I like to be immersed in like nature, basically, so I can clear my mind completely and I can reevaluate myself and others around me. Um, I get a lot of that from traveling as well. Um, I like to see different cultures. I like to see how other people live. I like to see how other people eat, like different things. Um, you know, I think a variety of things makes a person stronger like their resilient their resiliency sorry is stronger um i think for me personally um growing up i graduated from jesus school which is a catholic you know um, middle school and i wanted to go to cardinal dockety roman catholic and all of those other catholic high schools but my mother couldn't afford it so i took the magnet test um for central wb saw and um, another, you know, um, I think it's Masterman and other schools that were in the magnet um, school system. I got accepted into WB Saul. And um, like I said, I'm very into nature. Like, I like horticulture. the old, I mean, I ride by that one all the time. It's on Henry Avenue. Yeah, yeah, it's the only, Avenue. it's the only, yeah. only agricultural it's school. It's the only farm city. school the only in farm the city school. of Philadelphia. So, um, and you can still buy vegetables there. Right? Absolutely. You can buy meat. <laughs> you can buy, you can buy meat. Um, this was, we were selling like organic produce before the whole quote unquote organic yeah, move, yeah. movement was going on. But um, I kind of like, when I was going there, it was just like a breath of fresh air. Um, you know, we were close to nature too, right? Oh yeah, we had complete freedom during lunchtime. We could go into the woods and like sit at the on a little lo a log at the creek and just you know chill and talk. Um, the professors were very down to earth, um, but I came across some adversity a little bit. Like um, there's not a lot of African American males there. Um, there were a lot of African American girls there, but guy wise, it wasn't really a lot of us. And um, I kind of had to find myself. Um, I got into a few situations where. I was pointed out as like the elephant in the room sometimes. Oh. And, um, you know, it was pretty, it was kind of a bad situation when I was young. I didn't handle it well. I just automatically wanted to like fight or whatever. And, um, you know, that kind of got the best of me, but I kind of remembered my roots back in Catholic school, like talking to Father Bear, Father Neil, and those positive role male um, role models in my life. And they kind of told me, like, you know, Taylor, like, I kept hearing their voice, Taylor, focus on the positive things. Like, mm -hmm. don't worry about, like, what's going on around you. Focus on you. Focus on what you're trying to achieve. And I just listened to that, and it just catapulted me to different heights in my life. Um, I'm very positive at everything that I do. I actually have a, you know, a dry erase board in my room, and I write down everything, like, that I want to do in life, like a bucket list. Oh, okay. Um, you know, and my friends that I hang out with, I like to hang around positive people. A lot of the negative friends that I grew up with in North Philly, I might see them, you know, occasionally high and by, but it's no more like hanging around each other and stuff like that. So I think what you were talking about hanging in the positive garden is like surrounding yourself around positive people and positive environments. Yeah, I think so, that's very true. Yeah. It sounds like such a simplistic thought, too, when you, when you think about it. But I've often said to people, you, you need to get rid of that person in your life mm -hmm. because they're not helping you get anywhere. As a matter of fact, they're, they're just dragging you and pulling you down. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, the other point that I think you make is an important one. Uh, as you grow and expand in your own consciousness, there is a thought that uh, if you have all these people following with you, but in reality, you have less and less people that you could actually relate to. If you said to me today, how many friends do you have? I would probably say very, very few. 
Yeah, I, don't I mean, I have very <laughs> few friends. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of acquaintances, but I have very, very few close. people who are close to me. I would say you count them, you know, and probably a couple fingers. That's mm -hmm. about it. But, and in my old neighborhood, there's nobody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think once, once a year, I think I meet with a friend of mine who became a lawyer mm -hmm. and an accountant. And, and we just reminisce and have dinner. But I don't see them that much because I have, don't have much in common. And I have a funny feeling that part of resilience, there's a certain acceptance of the loneliness of being resilient because the only way you're going to find camaraderie is finding other resilient people mm -hmm. who have come through that same avenue. Do you th the, the, the thing about me is I don't mind not having a whole bunch of friends. I have a small group of friends that I can really, truly, honestly call my friends. Um, I have associates, people that I talk to, um, you know, here and there. Um, I might go out to the bar with or to a party with, but I wouldn't consider them friends. I, I couldn't open up my deepest feelings to them mm -hmm. and like things that are going on with me that are very serious. But um, I kind of think of myself as like a stoic person. I don't know if that sounds sure, good, no, but sense. like um, I'm not really emotional. Like um, even the, the current girlfriend that I'm with now, she describes me as very serious. Like I'm a serious individual, um, you know, what she likes. But it's it's kind of to the point where sometimes I try to be more loose and like, you know, chill and calm. But it's hard for me because it feels like it's not natural for me to be like too loose. I like to always be serious and like focused on my goal. Mm -hmm. um, I think I obtain like a lot of grit because my long-term goal is I want to be an environmental attorney and um, I'm working so hard to become that. Like I'm not letting anything stop me. Um, we were talking earlier about like, um, you know, I'm at the University of Pennsylvania now, but it's being very expensive to stay there. Um, so I looked into going to Temple next semester in the honors program. So just that little road in the block, I mean that, you know, that little hurdle in the road basically tried to stop me from like continuing my education because it was too costly. But I'm trying to find ways, like you said, the water always finds a way around the rock. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of using that attitude to catapult me to where I want to be. And I, I think you're, you're in the right space. I mean, in reality, you're not getting hung up and one place or another and you're mm -hmm. saying you have this overall goal that you and this is really what resilience is all about mm -hmm. you have this space that you want to eventually work in mm -hmm. and and you're you're going to get there mm -hmm. and you want to know something you'll get there mm -hmm. when you lose that focus then you won't get there mm -hmm. because you'll get there eventually you know and I, you know i you know i mentioned during the break you know, the, is that when i was applying for uh, a doctoral program you mm -hmm. know i could have gone to a lot of different ones because i had done some nice work and i'd published some material prior to going back. And, uh, and I only applied to Columbia University and to the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, I want to go to one of those places. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like, you know, and I was determined to get there one way or another. It, that meant I had to study like 20 hours a day. I was going to get there because I did not want to be a person who assumed would fail. I mean, because failure was a, just a part of my life when I was younger. You know, you, you're never going to be, you're never going to do this, you're never going to do that. So I, I think having that, uh, that goal and that objective and then working on it and staying with it mm -hmm. and realizing that maybe in some cases uh, someone maybe who might have an IQ of 180 or 160 or whatever only needs to put in six hours or three hours. Mm -hmm. We might need to put in 10 hours, mm -hmm. but that's okay. In the end, We'll all have the same degree, mm -hmm. and then you, when you go out there to work, you'll, that same in, resilience and strength that you talk about will make you a very successful person. Mm -hmm. I mean, how often have we seen? And I, you know, I have three children, and one of my children I always thought was an, an underachiever. I don't want to mention because he might see this, <laughs> and I won't say which one it is. But I, I, he's a very, very bright guy, but never really applied himself and kind of like worked his way through graduate school and all, but always at like half pace. You know, and I, and I said, I, gee, I wish I had his intelligence because I always I just thought he was brighter than I was. But I, I mean, but I, I never told him that, though. Mm -hmm. When he hears this, maybe he'll say it. But I mean, and, and the question is, what, why didn't he work to his potential? See, see, you're working, it sounds like, to your potential. You're working to your, I'm sure Connie, and, and I think I have too. 
See, we have the big R of resilience working for us. Don't you, don't you think we, we... No, we need to definitely working with you, I would say that, yeah. Absolutely. And it, you know, it's interesting, the research on intelligence has shown, right, well, first of all, we can question what is intelligence. Yeah, and we can talk program, about it as right? multiple intelligence <laughs> right. if we like, right. which is a nice concept. Um, but that's not necessarily the thing that gets you where you need to be. Right. You know, that this idea of grit or resilience seems to be this powerful force, right, uh, of the effort and the goal and the drive and the not giving up and the trying again and trying new ways, right, yeah. seems to make the difference. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, when we talk sometimes, and I know you've had this debate with colleagues about is there such a thing as multiple intelligence, the IQ, EQ, and, mm -hmm. you know, and all kinds of things. And I'm a firm believer that there is. I mean, there, there are people who are just brilliantly emotionally EQ people, I call mm -hmm. them. And there's IQ people. And good people have a balance. I mean, successful people are, have a combination and a balance of it. Now, there's, there's always a debate, as you know, about whether there is such a thing as multiple intelligence because we tend to concentrate on the IQ most of the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced there is, but some others are not. Right. Growing up, uh, I, I remember hearing um, street smarts, book smarts. Yes, that's right. So, you know, when they said for common sense, everybody would have it. So, um, I look at it, you, you do have to be balanced as well. I know a couple people, when I look back, they were on top of everything. Like, they, they breezed through school. We had different tracks, track one, two, and three, and through yeah. school. Oh, we stayed around two or three, but the other ones were AP and one. They would breeze through, but then you would speak to them about what's going on in the street. And I think not. they made them, no, they're more focused on that, or maybe they just didn't pay attention. I'm not knocking what they did or didn't do. It was just we were in a different way at that point. And he was talking about, like, even with uh, Jesus, um, he fell, got back up, as we all should do one way or another, you know. And then also with the the, uh, uh, the storm coming at you, if you don't use your experiences to work that problem learn out and learn things, from it, yeah. then I've walked from birth, always heard uh, do the same thing, expecting a different result. No, yeah. doing the same thing. And expecting a different result is a, a sign of mental weakness or cra we would just say yeah. crazy. Yeah, so um, learning to just find a different way around that issue. And it seems like we've all done it. I met with Connie maybe a month ago at this point. We talked about, she mentioned University of Pennsylvania. I never thought I would, you know, for me, would hear anything about UAP, but I would like to go there as well because that's one of the schools that you hear the name and it's, sure, yeah. it's the association. Mm -hmm. Right. I think um, I love working at the community college because uh, you get a chance to really talk to people and, and add to their idea what a possible future could be, right? So depending where we may have all started, we might not have been even been aware on, about some of these possible futures, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, and, and I, I've studied with people who had gone to their undergrad at Harvard, right? And um, I see students in my classes who are on par with, with those same students. Sure. And so um, some of it is just the accident of birth, right? Where you ended up being born and you may have the EQ, the IQ, the social support to do some amazing things in your life. But, but maybe the people you ran into didn't know what those opportunities were. So can yeah. we... Well, you know, you know what I also say, and, and I, we have two students here from, um, you know, kind of at the college. The, the, other, the other thing I would say about, you know, it's almost like uh, uh, the, the students need to become almost like uh, more uh, of uh, uh, culturally sensitive to education and how it runs. It, I, I don't know. Like some people are excellent speakers, but speech is not the same as writing. And, and you need to learn how to write what you speak, but they're not, I mean, this is my experience, they're not, they're not the same. Although you need to express both of those contents in order to be successful in the world. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, some people are more visual learners, some people, you know, there's all kinds of different learners out there too. So in, in some ways, uh, community provides a space. That's one of the reasons I like community college. I mean, I hate to, to tout community college all the time, <laughs> but it, it's one of the spaces I, why I like being here, and that is, you can actually see people seriously grow here and become successful and resilient through hopefully the rest of their life.
Maybe that's a good way to end the, uh, the uh, show today on uh, keep moving forward, keep life alive, and be resilient. Well, that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank my guest, Taylor uh, and Delano, and my co-host, uh, Dr. Connie Watson. You have been watching Tapestry of Life on CCP-TV, the educational channel of Community College of Philadelphia. I'm your host, Dr. Pascal Scholes. See you next time. Thank you.